Genesis 4152, God has caused me to prosper in the land of my affliction. We remind you as a child of God that your condition was not your position. As a patriot, you kept Thomas Jefferson's secret in Paris, but your life and those that followed in your footsteps should not and will not be secret. We are thankful that we can share your story with the world. Your life and your achievement matter. If it wasn't for memories, what would we have? People don't know who James Hemings is because he was a slave and he did not fit the mold. They could not put his face on a cereal box or a rice box or a waffle box and leverage it into something that was a familiar trope. In order for us to achieve any sort of healing, any sort of redemption as a nation, we have to recognize our ancestors and recognize that they are not the ancestors just of the black folks, but of everybody else. Every Southern chef, every single one of them has the granddaddy, James Hemmings. Firm ice cream. You like ice cream, Doc? Macaroni and cheese. Macaroni and cheese? Hey, you know what I like. Bless his highly nutritious microwave more macaroni and cheese dinner. Whipped cream. Yummy. Creme brulee. You order creme brulee for dessert. French fries. I really like fries and I was saving for last. It went from one slave kitchen in Charlottesville around the world. Jefferson's kitchen was the premier kitchen in America. And it all started with James Hemings. From that slave kitchen in Monticello, my name is Ashbel McElveen. I am a native of Sumter, South Carolina. I'm a chef. I'm a patriot. My story didn't start when I was born. My story started in the 18th century. I know that there's a ghost in America's kitchen because he visited me. James Hemmings. What he brought to American gastronomy makes him the archetype for our agency in this large just sort of culinary project. Not only was he trained as a chef, he exhibited incredible patriotism by protecting the American delegation in Paris. James Hemmings is a founding father of American cuisine, full stop. The things that I've learned about James Hemings, everyone should know. What was it about the cooking of black chefs like James Hemings? Or let's just keep it real, James Hemings alone. They made some of these dishes so, not only delectable, but put into scripture. Nobody had more refined training. Nobody had his palate. Nobody had his experience and nobody had his blues. James Hemings was Thomas Jefferson's brother-in-law, but also his enslaved property. There's an old African proverb that says, until the lion gets its own storytellers, 
The story of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. James Hemings at 19, an enslaved uh, American from Virginia, went to France with Thomas Jefferson and not only excelled in the culinary arts, he literally is America's culinary founding father. James Hemings is one of those figures that has always been with us, always been present, and yet invisible. A ghost in the kitchen. He is part of the most documented families in America, and we have no portrait of him. We have supposedly just one thing written by his hand, an inventory list of a kitchen. I personally believe there are other things that he wrote. He was literate, he was English and in French. I can't believe that there aren't letters or things or journals or something somewhere that may have gotten lost or ruined or, or intentionally hidden because Part of that time that he came from was to never reveal how brilliant and talented black people were. Because if, if other Americans, non-black people knew that, how do you justify the conditions you put them in? We have something that I refer to it as societal, institutionalized racism. So that means the entire society is wrought with institutionalized racism. James Hemings is the most overlooked revolutionary figure in American history, particularly for our foodways. And he's been overlooked for a very, very basic reason, racism. Absolute culinary racism. Culinary art. Culinary arts, painting. I always thought culinary arts was about cooking. Shows you how wrong you can be. Culinary arts has got to do with culinary. If you were dining fine in the South, like they did on the plantations, if a black hand put it down on the table in front of you, that was considered fine service. In the counties where you had the greatest amount of, of slavery in Virginia. The population was 60 to 70, 80% black. Williamsburg, the colonial capital of Virginia, 52% people of color. You couldn't live without enslavement. You couldn't live without black people. You couldn't live without black culture. And you won't find any inferences in Southern regional cooking from colonial times to uh, emancipation, where there was a white cook. You know, the history of cooking in America, for me, starts when I came here in 1959. At that point, I worked at the Pavilion, then moved on to Howard Johnson. But when I worked at the Pavilion, I knew many, many of the chefs in New York, of big hotel, restaurant, and so forth. I did not know one white American chef, those first Chef that I met in America, really American, were black kid. Uh, I've been very strongly influenced by young American chef who, black, who never get any recognition. Um, we've been marginalized. We've been um, downgraded. Our contributions have been downgraded. And African Americans have performed in a way that is very similar to the way our celebrity chefs perform today. These are people who performed at a particularly high level at work. But when we have thought about African Americans in the food world, the story has been the reverse. We have spent most of American history focused on the food that African Americans prepared at home in a survival kitchen, in trying to make something from nothing. Um, as part of a marginalized community. And, and what I'm saying is that while we want to respect and appreciate and honor people for that, we also want to recognize that there was a, a group of people that performed at a very high level and are responsible for what we know uh, as fine dining today, and we have not given them credit for what they accomplished. Fine food in America was associated with having a black hand lay food down on the table for you. 
Today, if we visit a social gathering in the South, we'll see the separation of society into distinct groups. People who were in the upper, upper class had an extraordinary dinner setting around two to three o'clock in the afternoon in the summer, and maybe slightly earlier in the winter. So to be a cook for one of those sweet scented tobacco, wealthy plantations, we're talking about 12 dishes in two settings. You were in a constant cycle when you were cooking. It was never, it was ever, never ending process. Selecting the food, ordering the food, slaughtering animals, growing the food, purchasing food at market. First of all, you gotta raise the chicken, right? You gotta kill the chicken. You have to kill the chicken right before you cook the chicken because you can't refrigerate the chicken. Then you gotta pluck the thing and then, that's just one chicken. It took days to make a meal. Somewhere in this hectic schedule that our ancestors were forced to endure, we not only created a culture for ourselves, but a cuisine for the South. We received from the big house on down, foods that in our hands taste like nobody else when we make them. That's the Hemings legacy. Blatant absence of people like Hemings in historical records and archives and, and acknowledgements is that we have to understand that we live in a world, and particularly in a society, where privilege is enjoyed to a large extent by the convincing portrayal of superiority over others. When you talk about class, then the natural step is then to talk about status. And when you talk about status, then the next implication is who has less and then who has more. Luxury is a weapon, it still is. And I think luxury will always be uh, a weapon. What is being actually weaponized is scarcity. Scarcity has always been weaponized. The things that are few and far between. With the world as we live in it now, it's critical that within each sector of our society that we maintain the tenets of institutional racism. It's a part of the business model. And the more you start to point out and illuminate those from other classes that have equally accomplished things to be at the same level of recognition, then you open the door to the question about why isn't everyone enjoying privilege? So you disrupt the model. And James Hemings is a disruptor. Dinner is ready. Won't you join us? When we talk about the Hemings story, it's an, it's, an, it's an incredible amalgamation of two very dedicated ways of looking at food. You know, here I am going, wow, you know, when the French system, look at the food in the market. Is it peak? Is it good? Is it tender enough? When I cook it, you know, is it gonna, is it gonna sing on its own? To translate one pot meals into delicacies. You notice a lot of those come over. The, the idea that we make big meals from these grand preparations that I was basically is one pot. There's all the, it's, it, there's all these conversations in the, between enslaved people and free people of color, in the mind of the enslaved that have to happen, that are gloriously important, but we don't, we've never focused on those things. How do we pass on a legacy to our children? Somebody had to have that conversation with each other. Somebody had to laugh for a change instead of just cry. Somebody had to have a moment where they were working with another African woman and going, okay, we gotta make this work so that our kids know what home tasted like. Barbecue, for example, I live in New Orleans, Louisiana. I got homesick. New Orleans got great food. But I wanted barbecue that I was accustomed to. I couldn't get it. Only way I could get it is I prepare it. The food, the palate is your way back home. And that was kind of how a lot of culinary history and recipes and et cetera 
passed down in the African-American community because it was less about write this down, keep this recipe in the Bible, and many people did that. But in most families, it was look at what I'm doing. I had wonderful examples to learn from. There were two working chefs in my family. My Uncle William, a World War II vet, when he came back as a GI, he went to dental school. But he couldn't get a job after graduating as a dentist. He couldn't get a job, so he became a chef. At a whites-only country club. Many of the ideas that we still associate with the people of the South came from the days when plantation life was in full flower. The food was always the solace. My mother, Aretha Ludd McElveen, was the executive chef at Gladys Chitler's. Back in those days, you were just the cook. My mother was the head cook at the restaurant, so food was everywhere. It was home, it was community, it was work. My personal history is, is kind of like American history. There is so much inspiration, but there's also so much pain. I was 13 years old when my mother had a heart attack. And she was denied being put in an ambulance because the ambulance was a segregated white only ambulance. And we watched her die there for over an hour. That is, you know, one of the leftovers from the Jeffersonian theories of the differences between the blacks and the whites. Thomas Jefferson is directly related to the person driving the ambulance that denied my mother's literal humanity. And so all, all of these stories are, are common um, during segregation. And all of this just, just has a root in America that I think is started in colonial times. The references that Jefferson made in Notes on Virginia way back in the 18th century, which really codified racism and Jim Crow and extending that whole bondage of slavery. Many people using his example of, you know, the differences between blacks and whites is that whites could have taste, but blacks could not. It's an argument that's been used and overused for racist pretensions to this day. What enslavement really translates out to, I have you in bondage. I own you. But I have to have you cook my food. Now, at any point in time, you could decide to make my food a special way and interrupt my life existence or my digestive process but I'm going to cede to you something incredibly personal. My mother, if we were eating dinner and back then there were homeless people show up on the back porch, she'd take a spoon of food from every plate and make a plate for whomever that was on the back porch. That's why I have an open table where all races are welcome to break bread with me, and I got that from my mother. I left South Carolina when my mother died at age of 13, and we moved to Connecticut, where my father was. I had an image of being black and whole, but I did not feel I was an American. And it wasn't until I was 19, the same age as James was when he went to Paris, when I actually felt like I was American. In 1970, when I first went to France, I didn't know that I was walking in the parallel footsteps of James Hemings, who didn't have a developed culinary training in Virginia cooking at the time, but came back to America as an accomplished and talented French chef. Over my career in the culinary field, I first learned from master 
cooks and chefs in my family in South Carolina and Virginia, and spent about 10 years living in France, as well as about 15 years living in the UK, where I opened a restaurant and was blessed enough to have a four-star review of American Southern cooking from the London Sunday Times. That's one more. My spiritual encounter with James was after I had drank the Jefferson Kool-Aid and did a dinner in 1993 at the Beard House as a tribute to Jefferson and the Africans that cooked in his kitchen, okay? I didn't know anything about James Hemings. Since Jefferson was so enamored of the French, it is rumored that his, even his brother's son, who was half black and and half white was sent to culinary school in France. A meal set for Jefferson on the table on an antique platter right from the era. I had heard a rumor that one of Jefferson's uncles or brother, son, had accompanied him to Paris to learn to be a chef. And that's all I knew. I had no inkling that James Hemings was indeed um, the half-brother of, of Jefferson's wife, Martha. After that dinner, I was in bed, asleep, and I woke up in a cold sweat. And my ears were ringing, and all I heard was, how could you, of all people, forget me? And I didn't quite understand what was happening, but I knew it was a spirit. It was so scary. You cannot know your country unless your country knows you. In our culture, food isn't just something I eat because I'm hungry. Food is something that provides a communication, a mystical experience between the living, the dead, and those who are to be born. When we eat the food of our ancestors, we're experiencing their world. A little tiny piece of them is speaking back to us in a way that was never supposed to happen. I have been in spaces where I've cooked, 18th and 19th century spaces, where I have had spirit encounters. At first, it's, it's alarming and it's unnerving. And then, once you get the hang of it and you know what you're doing, you go, okay, well, you know, before I even begin cooking, I need to have a conversation with you. He saw the facility to contact me as a spirit to say, wake up, guy. Here's what really happened. And it put me on that path of discovery in the process of finding myself and James Hemings. I found out Thomas Jefferson never cooked an effing thing. It's an amazing story of historical culinary theft. Virginia Housewife, the first, the first Southern cookbook, as they like to say. Thomas Jefferson and his daughters claim authorship of their favorite dishes. <laughs> Think about Mary Randolph for a moment. She was called the queen of the kitchen. It's no accident that Mary Randolph is also kin to Thomas Jefferson. So in the Virginia Housewife cookbook, or all of these French recipes attributed to Jefferson's granddaughter? This man's favorite, you know, delicacy meat was guinea fowl, an African bird. People like him in Washington love their hominy for breakfast and hoe cakes. That was our hard tack. They didn't have to eat hoe cakes. But apparently somebody made that stuff taste so good, that's what they wanted. They wanted their hominy, they wanted their grits, they wanted their hoe cake for breakfast. Setting a tone for other Southerners. And if you ever want to think about who put the first French fries into your mouth, macaroni and cheese, firm ice cream. I'll travel anywhere and I'll talk to anyone. 
meringues. And creme brulee. About James Hemmings. Nobody's giving him that credit. And he's never gotten the credit for achieving that feat. And I will question any historian view of what Jefferson wrote down. Origins, French fries and macaroni and cheese didn't go from the country of origin around the world. It went from that slave kitchen in Monticello around the world. There's this kind of separation of black identity from the rest of American history and American culinary um, identity that is disingenuous because you can't tell honest stories about American foodways without telling um, the black culinary parts of it. Um, they don't exist separately. And when you you're honest about this history, this rich, ethnic, complicated history, all of a sudden, this American narrative makes more sense. Virginia's imports of Africans were about 40 to 50% from Nigeria. And then beneath the James are more Congo Angolans and a mixture of Ghanaians, um, like the Akan, the Ashanti, the Fanti, et cetera, the Eve, the Ga, and the other groups. And some of those people filter into North Carolina because North Carolina has no um, slave trading ports that actually can, can hold that many ships because it was the graveyard of the Atlantic. But I say that to say that there is a greater Virginia and a greater Virginia food culture. And you can say Chesapeake, you can say Tidewater, you can say greater Virginia, it's all the same thing, that goes from, let's say, Baltimore all the way down to even to North Carolina and west of Charlottesville and Albemarle County where James Hemings was enslaved. Betty Hemings was the property of John Wales, who was Jefferson's wife's father. Betty Hemings had six children with John Wales, including James Hemings and Sally Hemings. And when John Wales died, Jefferson was married to his daughter, Martha Wales. And so he, as the male, he inherited her property. And at that time, slaves were like Lexuses and BMWs, so you didn't try to throw them away. You sold them, you traded them. It was real wealth. When Wales died, James was about nine years old. He was brought with the entire family of Betty Hemings to Monticello. In 1784, Three of America's signers of the Declaration of Independence, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, and Ben Franklin, were in Paris. James Hemings was the culinary founding father who was there at that time. When Jefferson was given the appointment by Washington, he took James for express purpose of learning to be a French chef. So James Hemings is the first American trained classically as a chef. He Tiger Woods did over in Paris, and you know, in terms of like even doing better than the, the French people that he was learning from and learning with. Hemings became chef de cuisine, speaking French in another language, in like less than three years or so, and this is absolutely amazing to be able to do that. So he must have been a very bright, intelligent man and learning very fast, certainly to manage uh, a group in the kitchen and to know all of those basics of cooking, serious technique and all that. It took me much longer than it did for him. I think James Hemings is definitely a missing figure in our history. And he did so much to shape the, I think, entertaining uh, reputation of Thomas Jefferson. Food becomes this narrative that shifts the paradigm around how we think of the life of the enslaved. We're part of the power broking of American society, along with our food as the lubricant that makes everybody, makes it all go around, makes everybody work with each other. You can't understand America without understanding agricultural history. I bled, I cut my hand building a pit. And every time I look at my middle finger, I see the laceration from that cut. When I cook that cow, I sweat over it for 20 something hours. I looked at every shovel of coals when I underneath that cow. I knew I had a certain placement that only I knew. And I cried at the end 
I cry because I don't know how many African Americans have done a whole cow in a hundred and something years and be able to serve a bunch of majority black folks. Because I look at the literature, black folks were cooking barbecue, but they were doing it for political rallies. Barbecue, a barbecue wasn't just like, hey, we want to have some fun. A barbecue was, let me get your vote. Who was doing the barbecuing? A black man. And it was the food of politics. Thomas Jefferson understood the elegance of a table and what that can do in terms of diplomacy. I mean, this is a man from Virginia, right? He's, he's country bumpkin, relatively speaking. And I'm sure his eyes were opened in his travels tremendously. And so his, his brilliance is that he was like, well, what if I did this back in Virginia? I could negotiate and navigate and impress and create. And I can do this because I own a talented family member, <laughs> basically, uh, who I can train and who is, is obviously gifted at it. Good food puts people in the mood to negotiate. Leaders that were very savvy about the use of foods were able to get their political agendas implemented because they had a charm offensive using food. And Thomas Jefferson was one of the best at that. I had the privilege of being chef to three different French presidents in France. And uh, this is what Eming did also. So the complexity of the work when you work for the president is quite a lot. For him to be able to cook at Chantilly, you know, which was the place where Vattel died and cook for the king of France, uh, it is amazing for him to have been able to manage and control the complexity of the food and the team in the kitchen in that little amount of time in another language, wow. At this very important point in American history, there was enormous debt to French bankers. The American Revolution would not have succeeded if France had not financed all of the money for arms, cannons, came from France and they were figuring out how to keep the balance of America's credit standing in the world. James Hemings is the older brother of Sally Hemings. And Sally came to Paris with Jefferson's youngest daughter. She and Jefferson apparently started some kind of romance because when she returned to uh, America with him, she was pregnant. That child was lost, uh, but she subsequently had six children by Jefferson. It was the age of enlightenment, and uh, Jefferson was a darling of enlightenment because of how he wrote about the rights of man. But he did not say to anyone that he owned slaves in America. In fact, he hired a lawyer to advise him on how to proceed with James and Sally, with them being undeclared in France, because he never declared them either, which he was supposed to do by law. All James had to do was to walk into the Admiralty Court and declare his freedom. But if he had done that, he would have ruined the credit of the United States. And he knew that. We didn't insert himself declaring his freedom. He came back to America for family and country. Eming coming back to the United States with Jefferson was always a puzzle for me. He got recognition in France. He worked in great restaurant. Uh, he could have gotten his freedom and his French nationality from the government in France. But I guess the love of his country and his family was stronger. He came back to America uh, with the training that basically no American chef had at the time. And a lot of times I thought, why would you do that? Why would you actually come back to slavery? And it's the act of a patriot and belief that Thomas Jefferson 
the central powerful figure in his life would somehow miraculously believe the stuff that he espoused in France um, about the uh, equality of man and the nature of, of freedom. Being black in love in this country is probably one of the most patriotic things, the most patriotic acts, right? Like, in the midst of such a complicated relationship with the country that um, you could easily write off as negative, holistically negative. If we confront the truth of our relationship with this country and are still able to be patriotic and still love where we're from and, ha and see value and power in our legacy in this country, that is the very definition of patriotism. The way of life our forefathers established on this foundation of freedoms drew people from the far corners of the earth. And all those who set foot on these shores had the opportunity to build a better life for themselves. Soon after their return to New York from France, James Hemings would cook the most important dinner in early American history. The Assumption Dinner in 1790, where James cooked the meal that reconciled Hamilton, Madison, and Jefferson in a backrooms deal, they decided how the debt from the colonial war would be repaid. And the debtors were all French bankers and aristocrats. And they were clamoring for the money back. And that dinner, that balm that James provided with good food, allowed this agreement to happen. It was a hot June day. He served the monumental dessert, vanilla ice cream wrapped in warm pastry. It took me two years to figure out how he did it. I kept saying, it's a fireplace. He's cooking all of this in the fireplace. How did he make this happen? And he made it happen with two new things to America. One were copper pots, which conduct heat very evenly, and he learned how to make meringues in France. They are whipped egg whites or insulators. So when you make a firm ball of ice cream, you can coat that in meringue, wrap pastry around it, and bake it. And once it's done, you don't taste the meringue. You only taste the vanilla ice cream and the warm pastry. And to bake it, James very cleverly took two of those pots, turned them on top of each other, put a spoon in the middle, and it was an instant oven. An instant oven. And it was not until 1845 at Delmonico's <laughs> that meringue and baked Alaska was invented. But James had done that and brought it into America for the first time, but used it in a novel way to make this dessert for this meeting. You talk about the, the, the compromise dinner we cooked. Our food is this, you know, sort of unifier, this, this sort of the, the table becoming this battleground for hard conversations, but also um, wildly um, productive. Cutting out all kinds of foolishness and just getting down to what makes us equal and human. Food is at the center of it. And so, to me, especially as a professional chef, thinking about the power that Black chefs have always wielded. You had at your fingertips the the potential, the sort of the power to change minds. When you bring two people in front of a good meal that tastes good, not only does it taste good, but your olfactory senses are stimulated, and your olfaction has great memory. If anything that you experience in your lifetime, your sense of smell will be the least impacted by age. So in addition to the visual representation, you know, of the food, the smell in itself uh, does wonders for the brains and it, you know, activates those neurotransmitters that send the message that this is a safe place, this is a feel-good place, you can relax. It's very disarming 
Food and just dining in itself is a very communal activity. So it puts people at a place and a position where they are not on a defensive, they can enjoy. And I think that allows for kind of processing and digesting information that they would otherwise disagree with. So it's a multifaceted experience. And we know from Hemming's life that he was an eyewitness to very important moments in U.S. history. So the fact that his food facilitated some key events in U.S. history, I think speaks to his prowess as a cook. Under the balm of James Hemming's impeccable taste and execution, and it was agreed how that the states would pay most of the debt left over from the Colonial War. And they also decided that Washington, D.C., would be the capital, that it would be on the banks of the Potomac instead of Philadelphia. Then on to Philadelphia, and by this time, Jefferson was Secretary of State, and uh, Philadelphia was a temporary capital. This was the White House. In the 1790s, a plague forced Washington and Jefferson and others to flee Center City, Philadelphia, to Germantown. One of the men who came through this house was James Hemings, our culinary founding father. Fine dining was brought to Philadelphia by enslaved black chefs. It's so critical that we look at this whole development from an Afro-Atlantic perspective, which means Europe, Africa, and the Americas in exchange. There were lots of black people who were in exchange. The stereotype that we have received is, once you were black and exiled, you were black exiled, and you just, you were just locked into a certain part of the system. And that's not true. Urban centers like Philadelphia were especially important because, you know, you could come on a ship, you could be, a, you could be from a farm in Delaware, you could be an escaped enslaved person from Maryland. You could be coming with your slaveholder from Virginia because, you know, there's all this Continental Congress stuff going on. All these things were possible, or from the Caribbean, and they're all mixing and conversing with each other, exchanging culture. And somehow, some way, a, a paradigm of the cultures evening out and us having a collective expression emerges just like language, music, spirituality, a collective expression emerges, and that becomes the African-American way. The United States of America, youngest by far of the world's great nations, stands today the envy of the civilized world. It's more than 130 million free people. It's 33 million homes. It's seven million farms. It's vast panorama of other resources. Industry and commerce, machines and structures beyond the dreams even of our own fathers. And above all the material blessings, government by consent of the governed. And so three years were spent in Philadelphia, and James was reluctant to come back to Monticello because Philadelphia had abolished slavery. And he feared that if he went to Virginia, he wouldn't be able to leave again. So Jefferson made a written contract with him. Having been at great expense in having James Hemings taught the art of cookery, desiring to befriend him and require of him as little in return as possible, I hereby do promise and declare that if the said James should go with me to Monticello in the course of the ensuing winter, when I go to reside there myself, and shall there continue until he shall have taught such persons as I shall place under him for that purpose to be a good cook. His previous condition being performed, he shall thereupon be made free. And that's been a constant theme in black America, litigating and pressing for our own rights that actually helped this country become a democratic republic. Three years were spent in Philadelphia, and then they came back to Monticello in 93, where that agreement was put in place. What's so important about this agreement, which frames a cooking tradition in America that's been picked up by the culinary schools. But the first one 
was created by an enslaved chap, James Hennix, because as a condition of his freedom was that he was to teach his brother Peter all he knew and had learned in France, the first cooking stool in America. James trained in France for five years. He comes back to America and trains his brother Peter. Peter never becomes James. Peter has other talents that he excels at, but he never quite achieves the cookery mastery that, that James achieved. So innovative and almost like a perfectionist in terms of how he worked at things and different recipes until, until he figured it out. And then he was just very generous. Yes, it was at the behest of Jefferson that he trained his brother and that he trained the Monticello cooks and that he trained other cooks at other plantations, but that was who he was. There's a sense of generosity that comes through that, a sense of, of uh, mastery. Somehow, the macaroni pie that James would have made became staple to Americans and, 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 and at, at its best form in our hands. That's the amazing part about it. There is this, we, we made these African traditions, frying, barbecuing, the way we spice our food, the ingredients, essential to being a Southerner. We planned this kitchen to take care of the preparation of food, eating, clearing, and some food preservation. You know, Patrick Henry's famous statement about Thomas Jefferson's kitchen, which is really James Hemming's kitchen at the time, was that it was half French and half Virginian, served in good taste and abundance. Well, what's half Virginian mean? We know what the hell that means. It's Afro-Virginian. When you say American, you're talking about all kinds of people from all over the earth. We live under one flag, but we have the right to see things and express ideas, each in our own way. That's why we set it up. That's what our revolution was all about. And the heart of those ideals rings in a single sentence of Thomas Jefferson's. I don't know how anybody could say it better. I have sworn upon the altar of God eternal hostility against every form of tyranny over the mind of man. On February 5th, 17, 96, James Hemings received his freedom from Thomas Jefferson and returned to Philadelphia. It would not be long before he would hear from Thomas Jefferson again. He was sent for by Thomas Jefferson to come to the White House to be the first chef in the White House. And he refused unless he was written a letter like Jefferson would write any free man. And his words were, when he was summoned the way he was summoned when he was a slave, he said, if he wants me, he can ask me himself. And exhibiting the first bit of African-American pride and presence, and actually challenging the most famous and powerful man in his universe to actually respect him as a free man and not as a slave. You must really consider the types of um, inner dialogue you have to tell yourself. Can you imagine to tell yourself that in spite of what I see, because we're visual creatures, that in spite of what I see, this is not my reality. It's more natural to give in to what you see. And it would be very logical and expected for you to respond to what your environment tells you you should be. But it's a different kind of person to look at and be in your environment and to defy it. It is an act of defiance. So he was standing up for his freedom and, and asking Jefferson to write this letter. And Jefferson viewed it as a letter to a black man, so he never wrote it. Uh, that refusal was literally Jefferson's way of assassinating James Hennings. He instead wrote that letter to a white French chef, Julien 
who became the first official chef at the White House. James went and got a job at a tavern in Baltimore where he's said to have drank himself to death. This is a shame, and uh, because he was really uniquely qualified to run a great restaurant in America. James Henry's death in 1801 was mysterious and poorly documented. I don't believe he drank himself to death. A black man standing out of the ordinary has always been a threat. Racial profiling existed in 1801 as it exists today. I pose this question. In Baltimore, at a tavern, cooking, where undoubtedly there were many poor white people, and here's a man in the finest clothes in the world, and he's black. And plus, he was free. That had to be an incredible invitation to do all kinds of things to him. And so I don't think that it was as straightforward as he drank himself to death. I think he was murdered. You know, I'll, I'll never forget the time that I was in the, um, the bathroom what well, used to be the bathroom at Monticello at that level. Now it's excavated. And I was in my white chef's getup, and I was cooking with Lenny Sorensen that day. And I took a selfie in the bathroom. It was me, and my head was up, and I'm in my clothes, and I'm looking good. I mean, it was the only time I was all in white. And you know, white is the color of spiritual transformation and spirit presence in African culture. And I swear to God, I wasn't the only person in that space. It was weird. It, was, it wasn't weird. It was actually kind of comforting. And it was almost like arms around me. And I walked out totally ignorant of the fact that I was in the space of the original kitchen. So I walk out and Lenny's like, yeah, that was the space. And it was almost like, okay, now I know why I felt that way. I had never been to that area before. I'd never been to the bathroom before, ever. I'd never even heard of it. I'd never been in that space. But I'm in that, and I, it was like somebody else was with me. The kitchen at Monticello, this ominous historical place, this ominous kitchen. I was sitting alone on a wooden bench in the causeway outside the kitchen, and there was nobody around, and I'm sitting there just collecting my thoughts and looking into the kitchen, and what I understood clearly coming back to me was what we did here, we did with pride, in spite of our circumstances. Love is an ingredient you can't make. It either have to be in you or not. And I'm saying, so when we had creative spirits like Hemings and so many others all throughout our history, they were just manifesting their highest potential and being decent human beings unselfishly. Because if he was as smart as he was, as he was reported to be, and as educated and all the other things, had he chosen, he could have orchestrated what was necessary to get his name in a book somewhere, in a picture, but it wasn't even on his radar screen, I believe. I think he was oblivious. I think he was said, just saying, I got access to the resources that will allow me to manifest my highest potential with this craft and this gift that I have. I think about the plantation life and what being able to cook meant for you in that space, what it meant for your life, what it meant for um, your own family, that you could, in the, in the midst of the most unimaginable inequity, you could find one place, one moment, Sunday dinner, that you could find some kind of dignity, that your ability to bake a perfect caramel cake could literally shift how you felt about yourself. 
food is the center of our humanity is really the, the simplest way to sort of boil it down, but um, your ability as a chef to wield that power is, I think, a huge responsibility. Effects of slavery and the whole ram social ramification that still exists today um, is, um, is palpable. And I am faced with the cost of the ignorance, the racism. And today, visiting my mother's grave, a woman who lost her life because she was not allowed to ride in a wife's only ambulance. This is my first time seeing her headstone. And the first time that I've visited her grave in 25 years. And I'm, I'm so blessed that I got her spirit and not a spirit of bitterness and uh, in spite of what happened to her. It's vitally important to understand where we come from and what influenced our lives. James Hemings um, is an example of the kind of role models that we need to hear more and more about. There are just so many opportunities and places where our young people could be getting involved. And if they um, see more people who look like themselves. It's motivational because as I go forward and people like me and my generation, they like, oh, James Hemings did that during these conditions, not just did it, but he was in slavery during oppression. We're now, I will say, quote unquote free, but we still have a lot of oppression, and, but we have a lot of resources, a lot of, we have gotten farther as a people. And so we can be, we can do first and we can do innovative and groundbreaking things to change society. You can have modern figures, not just a hidden figure. Hello everyone. We are now down to our sweet ending that Chef Ashdog McElveen. Jefferson has been sucking up all the air in the room. <laughs> and James Hemings has been enslaved to the Jefferson myth of fine food for over 225 years. <laughs> okay. I came to the food, the American food space um, feeling very much like an outsider, um, not seeing myself represented, not sort of understanding the historical context that sort of my physical presence, my ethnic presence, um, in this very white American narrative. And then you find James, you find um, this fully formed, autonomous, French trained chef, this this person who represents the exact embodiment of the, the kind of chef that you're told you're supposed to be um, in the form of this fully formed black man. Um, he all of, all of a sudden straight into your spine. He tells you that you are a uniquely American chef just by virtue of your, your ethnic identity. James Hemings represents that first generation of revolutionary era cooks chefs who, despite their status as enslaved black men, enslaved black people, create a revolution on the plantation. Their knowledge, their skills, and abilities will be passed down and will be spread throughout the community as a means and force of liberation. Economic spiritual, cultural, mental, professional liberation. And that's why they're so important. That's why the narrative of James Hemings is so important. And those that came after him. James, your achievements have made the world a better place. We recognize all of the unnamed enslaved peoples who toil with you. 
And we thank you all for showing us the template for fine dining in America. So may you find peace. Your life and your achievement matter.